Hey, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of the Horse Geeks podcast, where we look at horses and riding from the inside out. I'm Kirsten Nelson, professional horse trainer, and with me again is my good friend, Deb Romero. And today's topic, sorry, Deb Romero, certified Alexander <laughs> Technique instructor, my bad. Um, today's Everybody topic, knows already. <laughs> I know, we say this, it, if I don't say the same thing at the beginning of every podcast, I'm like lost. Okay. <laughs> I'm lost. And I started There's the working, habit in it all. I know. I started working on these audiobook podcasts that will actually be instructional. And it's like, even though it's lesson by lesson by lesson, I have to start it the same way or I lose my bearings. So that's funny. Yeah. <laughs> but actually, when I listen to people like on YouTube or podcasts, I kind of it feels reassuring to me to mm -hmm. hear their usual intro. Their so, opening, their intros. Yeah. And some people just say um, just the same word, like a single word or something, but it's, I don't know, blah, blah, blah. I digress. Let's get to the it's, topic. It's like you're on camera now. <laughs> yes. So the topic today, well, the last podcast we talked, so we talked about bits and bridles um, and the plan for today was to talk about rain contact, but I think we'll get to that in another episode. I wanted to kind of take a sidebar and talk about the term tracking up. And you know tracking up. There goes the eye roll. Oh, <laughs> um, oh look, he's tracking up. Yay. Well, and what's so interesting is I have a client <laughs> who I work with intensely, and um, she's going through the process of getting her judging certification. For and dressage? For dressage, but in the eventing world. Oh, okay. So dressage specific to eventing, I guess, is its own type of judge or its own organization. I don't know. I, okay. I, I thought dressage judges sort of intermingled between eventing and normal dressage, but apparently they don't. So this is um, an eventing organ organization, but she's learning to get her judging certification for dressage. Okay. So I guess cross country is just time and whether or not you wipe out. Time and faults, I think, yeah. Mm -hmm. Just like the stadium jumping. Right. So, so tracking up, you want to take first stab at sort of describing to a non-horse person what that means? A non-horse person. How would you, if it was a non-horse oh person... Who never heard the term tracking up. I'm trying to compare it to people, but I guess you can't. <laughs> I did think of some comparisons to people. I'll, you did? I'll, yeah, I'll bring that up later. Oh, that's cool. Um, well, let me jump in here. Yeah, tracking because up. the it, way the, the truth of it all is not what you what you're seeing. <laughs> well, it's technically what it means is that the horse's hind hoof print is landing in the hoof print that was left by the front leg on the same side. So in other right. words, tracking up means that the right hind hoof print is landing in or beyond the right front hoof print that was left. Okay. So if you're watching the tracks on the ground, you can see where when the front leg leaves the ground, the hoof print is there and the hind leg stepping forward into that hoof print or exceeding it is what we call tracking up. Right. <clears throat> so why is that important? It has become like a visual way that people assess engagement of the horse's hindquarter. So in other words, if the horse is placing the hind hoof into the front hoof print, front leg hoof print, then the horse must be engaged because the hind leg is coming so far forward. So now, it's, does, it's a does way to apply that, to any gait. I mean, are we talking at the walk, yes. at the trot? I think particularly canter? it's I, particularly it's talked about at the walk 
Okay. But it, yes, technically it would apply to any gate. Yes. So I think it's a way for people to, it's a good question. You know what? I know it applies to any gate, but I think it's most used as a way to evaluate engagement at the walk. Okay. Yeah. So it's like, um, it's particularly most used, I found out by judges to assess the horse maintaining engagement during the lengthening um, the, the, like the extended walk or whatever not loose, the extent not... like during where they want the horse in a free walk to okay. lengthen or now they have exercises that they call the stretching walk or the stretching trot that Interesting. are yeah and those are actually um judged they're they're different maneuvers within a dressage test that score Right. Okay. So the free walk, the stretchy walk and the stretchy trot. <clears throat> and then I think to your point, too, in any extended strides. Right. So extended walk, extended trot, extended canter, which just means a lengthening of the stride in general. So it's been really fascinating. Oh, sorry. Before I go here, now can you think of any human equivalent of tracking up? Like, I'm just thinking of walking in your own footsteps. Or, I what came to mind with people is power walking. Yeah, something like that. Or, I I remember when I was at your place one year, I was fascinated by, and I, I'm still fascinated by where people place their walking stones to get to their <laughs> front door and how we try to step on those stones, even if it doesn't go with our stride. That oh. just fascinates me. <laughs> I don't know why. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's like, why do I try that? I'm only five foot one. It's probably made for a six foot person. <laughs> <laughs> right. So you have to step up, step down, step up, step down. Step yeah, up, and I'm step like, down. why am I doing this? Just walk on the grass. Oh, that's so funny. Yeah, because whoever sets the stepping stones is just looking at their own unique stride. Exactly. Yeah. So in talking to my client, because she comes to me with a lot of questions as she's learning to assess movement in the dressage arena, she, you basically scribe for judges and then they do their own like trial scoring where they judge ah. and they, they see how it compares to the rated judge, right? So they have trial judging and then they sit with judges and they get to ask a lot of questions. And then as a group, all of these students t getting their judging certification, one rider will come in everybody will do the scoring and then they'll kind of compare and discuss why did you score this person so high or so low, or they'll see where they match other judges. So it's really interesting to hear about this whole process. And oftentimes my client will come to me and read the criteria. So the wow. judges have a criteria of how they're supposed to judge. So like, for example, in the stretching walk, um, I should have pulled it up. The criteria I remember was that the horse um, stays well engaged, lengthening through the back and, ne and neck with sort of the head lengthening and maybe falling to the point of the shoulder. So it's kind of on a looser rein, but that's some of the criteria, but well engaged, still working through the back, lengthening the top line with the head and neck stretching forward into a light contact or a looser rein. Um, and then I guess the pole sort of near the point of the shoulder. So not a long and low, more of sort of a long and level. Okay. So as my client's reading all the criteria, I'm going, yeah, 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 I'd agree with that. Yeah. So then it gets into, and nowhere in there did it say tracking up. It didn't. 
Not one single it thing. It didn't use that language. It didn't use that language. So in all of the judging criteria that I've read or looked at or she's read to me, there's not a single, all of the criteria I 100% agree with. I go, yeah, that would denote balance in that frame, right? Mm -hmm. Or at that level, that would show good balance. So all of the judging criteria, I think is pretty spot on. Then in the actual judging, when she's working with judges, it's more of like um, a tradition or, or just what everybody does. A trend? A fashion is what I a call fashion's it. Fashion's a good word. Fashion's a, a fashion. good word. In, and it's just a classical fashion, you know. But it's um, a lot of judges were using the tracking up as a criteria for the scoring. But it wasn't mentioned in paper. It's not on the paper. It just says on the paper. well engaged, using the back, lengthening the top line with the pole hanging somewhere near the point of the shoulder on a loose okay. ring. And I think that was true for Walker, the stretchy walk and the stretchy trot. Okay. So when she, it actually came to the judging, what the judges were saying to her <clears throat> is, I'm going to score this one a eight or a nine because look at how much that horse is tracking up. So the tracking up kept coming at that term or that uh, assessment, I I finally realized that's how they're assessing whether or not the horse is still engaged. Right. And what do you think of that? Do you think that would be an accurate assessment? Well, with what I know now. <laughs> I know. Giggle, giggle. Here comes the. <laughs> what I know now, I'm going to say no, because. We have come to an appreciation of what could what could be going on um, with the relationship between the placement of the front legs. Yeah. 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 So like what what completely pulled me off the path of using tracking up as a assessment tool for whether or right. not the horse was engaged. I go, it's not an accurate assessment tool. It's completely inaccurate. It means nothing. Right. And the reason I came to that conclusion was gated horses. Oh, that's obvious. Who are not in most, you know, eventing dressage classes. Yeah, I don't know. Don't see many there. I mean, it's possible that I do have clients mm -hmm. who event their gated horse or do there is gated horse dressage, but it shocked me how many judges were using that criteria. And when you look at a gated horse, the gated horse can be high headed, short neck, dropped back, obviously disengaged, like completely upside down. Yeah. And they can still track up. They will still over like their hind hoof will land way past, in front mm -hmm. past their front hoof print. <clears throat> Right. So I go, if tracking up was a reliable criteria, okay. Or a sign of healthy movement, it's not. It's not. Yeah. It's no. not a reliable criteria to assess engagement. And it's not even necessarily a sign of healthy movement. And when I was um, showing in or going to inspections, Hanoverian and Oldenburg inspections with my horses 20 years ago, they were using those terms. Yes. And thinking because of they, oh, look at that, that hun, hind foot is way in front of the placement of the front foot, but the front leg could be totally, the horse could be falling on their forehand and that front leg be way too far back. That's exactly it. Yeah. And so this sort of like, it, this term is so ubiquitous, like whether yes. it's you know, confirmation classes or dressage classes, it is used, at least in my lifetime, <laughs> everybody is using it. I don't know how far back that goes. But <clears throat> gated horses are a great example of how the hind leg can swing pretty far forward mm -hmm. while the spine is pushing down and the horse is completely disengaged. 
Well, and I've seen that. I, I have even <laughs> upper level riders that I've seen on Facebook in dressage tests. I'm seeing upside down. Exactly. Yeah. And, and what you just said, what you just said is what I told my client. I said, have you ever considered that the reason the hind hoof is tracking up is because the front hoof is not leaving the ground, that there's so much weight on the forehand right? that the front hoof has to go so far back towards the hind leg before it leaves the ground. So I said, exactly. have you ever considered looking at it from the other way around? That a horse on the forehand, which would be back down, disengaged pelvis, too much weight on the forehand, head up, or over curled neck, long mm -hmm. and low, dropped pole, right? All of those things in the neck use can mean that the horse has way too much weight on the front legs. Right. If there's way too much weight on the front legs, the front leg is doing the pushing. Right rather than the hind leg. So instead of getting engagement, that front leg barely reaches forward, spends most of its time pushing backwards, mm -hmm. and then the hoof doesn't leave the ground when it should because the front legs have too much weight. Yeah, and I've even seen it. It came up once. I see it several all over the place, but even when a horse is standing, if there's that, if those front legs are behind the vertical, yeah, kind of you, canted. You will often, yeah, you mm -hmm. will often see like a pigeon chest, you know, this bolding, bulging chest because those muscles are trying so hard to keep the horse from falling on their front end. Um, yes, it, it you can see it in halt. Yeah, where the front legs are not square and vertical, but they're right. actually sort of behind the vertical. Mm -hmm. That's a great example of the front hoof not leaving the ground when it should because it's overloaded. So, right. <clears throat> so then, of course, the horse tracks up because the front hoof print is left when the hoof leaves the ground. Right? Far back. Mm -hmm. And it's really far back if there's too much weight on the front legs. Yes. And so... That's what I told my client. I said, it's possible that there's so much weight on the front legs that the hoof isn't leaving the ground when it should. And so the tracking up isn't a sign of engagement. It's a sign of the horse being on the forehand. Yep. <laughs> and so she actually went to one of her judging classes. And when the judge that she was studying with or in the group, when they said the horse was really tracking up, she said, isn't it possible that that just means there's so much weight on the front end that the hoof isn't leaving the ground and maybe it's not engaged? And you know what? The best judges, the highest rated judges that she was working with looked at her and said, yeah, that's entirely possible. Yeah. Well, good. It's good but, to know that they know that. That's, yeah, but they hadn't we're, really we're thought about it. We're not flying solo. <laughs> <laughs> no, because like we feel like we are. <laughs> I think it's one of those things like you and I talk about all the time. It's just been a habit. Uh -huh. It's the way we do things. Instead of looking at it with a new set of eyes. Right. Or like, where did I forget where I heard this story but it was like every Easter, this family's tradition was to have a ham. And when you buy the ham, the first thing you do is you cut off six inches either side of the ham. You put that in the fridge for something else, and then you bake the ham. And somebody said, why do you do that? I don't know. My mother did it. Go to the mother. Why did you do it? My grandmother did it. Go to the grandmother. Why did you do it? Well, because my mother's stove was so, or oven was so small. So small. <laughs> that we had to cut off the end of the ham. So it was like, it was just a tradition because one person needed to do it. And so everybody did it, even though they had a bigger oven and a bigger dish. It is just a tradition. And that's kind of how I think tracking up has become. It's just because 
their <clears throat> their mentor used it as a judging criteria. So they use it as a judging criteria. But nobody's really questioned it. Nobody's looked at the actual kinematics or biomechanics or functionality of it. They're just looking at leg placement. Yeah. And you know what? Yeah. I also guarantee none of these dressage judges are looking at gated horses. Oh, probably not. Because even the gated horse dressage has their own criteria for judging. Huh? It, it's a slightly different criteria. That's why it's called gated horse dressage. Because gated horses, what I find is genetically, they're pretty hypermobile. Yes. Right? So they, they have a lot of motility in their joints. So their legs really swing <clears throat> almost like a double jointed person. Yeah. And that's when I'm working with somebody that quote unquote double jointed or whatever you call it. Those are the people that can go and get more injuries yeah. than, than people who aren't hypermobile because yes. of that problem. It same is true with gated horses. Yeah. At least the ones that come to me uh, usually will have significant challenges to their balance or their their behavior, which is really one in the same, or mm. they're they're coming back from injuries because of it. So yeah. that sort of hypermobility in a gated horse is just a great demonstration that no, you you can it can just be a hypermobility. It doesn't mean the hindquarters are engaged or the back is working or any of that, which is actually in the written criteria for the judges. Mm. But what they're doing is using tracking up. And I think that's why it's perpetuated is because maybe they're writing it out in the notes on your score sheet. Scribe. Mm -hmm. Maybe they're writing good tracking up, something like that. So it kind of gets perpetuated in training and it just keeps going. And nobody stopped to question to say, maybe it means the front leg is on the ground way too long. Yeah. Not that the hind end is coming through or engaged. It's just that the front feet are not picking up and leaving the ground. So the hoof print is too far back from the front hoof. Not that the hind hoof is really coming forward. And if you think about it, if that's happening, there is no way the hind end can engage. Exactly. You know, it, it's, it's impossible, you know, to see any engagement with that going on. Yeah. And I would think the back locks to sustain that, you know, that going backwards kind of with the front end. And what I always picture, because I see a lot of like movement in sort of geometric shapes, right? Uh, so what I always picture is, it's like the horse's torso, instead of being from a side view, sort of a rectangular shape with the mm -hmm. legs vertical underneath. That's a okay. side side view definition of square, what we traditionally call square, means the torso is rectangular, parallel to the ground, and the legs are vertical under that rectangle, mm -hmm. right? Um, that's a side view of square. And then <clears throat> the neck should be, the lengthening, the neck should be moving forward in a way, but the pole could be high level or even low, and you could still have that torso rectangle. That nice torso, right? right? <clears throat> so to me, a lot of what I see in the horse when people are like, wow, that horse is really tracking up. That horse must be great. Like my ex dressage horse, he tracked up over his front hoof print all the time yeah. and was completely out of balance. But that had been encouraged because of how they use it in the judging criteria. And he was a show horse. And that, <clears throat> that goes back to the, the whole thing of working with the Alexander technique where we're going for the product and the end result instead of actually looking at how the human or the horse is actually using themselves. Yeah. Like I think it's a simple visual tool that people right. can use 
and go, oh, that must mean, and not really even looking at the whole horse or the overall picture, but just sort of isolating this tracking up and then checking the box. Yeah, my horse is engaged, he's tracking up, we're right. good, right? And it's it's not that simple. No, it's not. It's just it's, not that it's, simple. Yep, I agree. It's not And that so simple. what we really need to look at is, is that rectangle of a torso sort of level and parallel over the ground with the legs vertical underneath? Right. So as the legs swing, they swing in front of vertical. And what we call peak vertical is the transition of the leg pushing or breaking. So the front leg swings forward. Right. And then pushes to, sorry, breaks, lands, breaks to peak vertical and then pushes off. So if there's too much weight on the front legs, it's going to land fast. And as it transitions from breaking or controlling the body into pushing, which is the acceleration for forward, it's going to land barely in front of vertical. It's going to transition mm -hmm. with the leg behind actual true vertical. Yeah. Right. And then it's going to keep pushing because that's what's propelling because the hind end isn't doing its job. And that's going to leave that hoof print way back past the girth. Yes. <clears throat> right. So then, of course, the hind leg barely has to move forward to land in the track. Exactly. Yeah. Right. So I think of a horse on the forehand, and lots of them are tracking up just fine, is that rectangle of a torso is sort of slanted forward and down. <clears throat> mm hmm. And I think of it almost transitioning from a rectangle into a parallelogram because now <laughs> the legs are going to be oriented backwards, backwards because yep. the torso is slanted forward. So yeah. it's like the whole shape changes. And that's not, you know, it's maybe hard to see that or the horse can also push the back down and sort of look like they have a rectangle. There's lots of ways for the body to compensate. But if we just think of sort of balance versus too much weight on the front end, that idea of the horse's torso shifting from sort of a rectangle side view to a parallelogram, and then both sets of legs, front and hind legs, are going to have to sort of slant backwards. Right. And that's what you were saying. You can see it in pictures on horses. Yeah, and what, what it's real helpful for me, if you're having a hard time visualizing it, is have somebody take a picture of the horse maybe next to a fence post, you know, so you've got a reference to see mm -hmm. or, or any kind of a vertical thing to see what's going on. And that's when it became very obvious to me Yes, because I had something to compare it to. Yeah. If you just put the horse up against the barn wall um, close to the wall that gives you a solid background you yeah. can start so you... to see the mm -hmm. outline and the geometry and and where they most habitually want their legs to be. Right. Because the placement of the legs, and this is a little bit controversial, but there are more modern research tells us that the placement of the legs is dictated by the use of the spine. And, and that is true with people. That's what Alexander Technique is all about, is mm -hmm. that... And we've talked about this on many podcasts, that the the organization of the axial skeleton, the skull, the spine, rib cage, and pelvis, dictates how the arms and legs can move. Right. Yeah, and not the other so way So the worst around. case scenario for the human is everybody, I think we mentioned this, the visual is somebody on a walker. That's somebody that you know, is bracing and using their arms and legs to balance and has lost all integrity of the spine. And that's a horse on what we talked about in the last podcast, a leveraged bit. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So they're... that's why we go to more leveraged bits and the horses learn to lean on the bit and the front legs, just like an old person on a walker. Yeah. And that bit becomes, which it did for my extrasage horse, the bit becomes the origin of stability rather than the hindquarters. And yes. so if, when I first rode him on a loose rein, I thought we were going to somersault. 
Oh my gosh, that would scare me to death. Yeah, because there was just, he kept seeking that stability in my hands and on the bit. And I go, well, what would happen if I don't give it to you? He goes, right. I fall I fall apart. Right. That's what I do. I fall apart. I have no self-control without the leverage on the bit. But and he it's tracks really up. total disengagement if you think about it. Yeah, that's the parallelogram Com with the legs completely behind Completely not engaged and it's falling apart. Exactly. Exactly. Because of the leverage created with the bit and the, the use of the rider's hands. Yeah. And so it's exactly we're creating with our rain use and our bit choice, we're creating the walker. We are the walker. Yeah. And right? how we leverage it. Yeah. Yeah. And it they, could be a simple bit. It doesn't have to be. It's how you use it. That makes the difference. Yes. And like we talked about last time, a lot of people go to leverage bits because it's a false sense of lightness. It is. Right? Mm -hmm. We The horse can be massively organizing its stability on the bit and we don't feel that heaviness in our hands. Right. In a snaffle bit, at least you feel when the horse is heavy or you see when the horse is getting behind the bit, dropping the pole. But in a leveraged bit, that horse can really be organizing on the bit, but we feel what we call light in our hands. Right. That's what leverage gives us. And so we might not even know that the horse is organizing on the bit or the walker. And I, I recall when I, I got my halflinger, I was riding him, I think, in a full cheek snaffle. And I mean, I felt like I was on a barrel rolling downhill, not <laughs> able to stop. Yes. And so, of course, I go, I go to a trainer. Oh, well, you need a, you need a leverage bit. Yeah, that's one of the which first, was interesting. First bits of advice we get. Yuck, yuck, yuck. It's yeah, is use this bit instead I mean, of why cool. is this happening? Why is my horse pulling me forward? Right. No, and if you go to any tax store, there's a wall of bits for every problem. <laughs> right. There are books on which bit to use for which problem you have. And it's like, oh, my gosh. But what we're really doing, if we think of the physics and the leverage of it, we are the walker letting mm -hmm. our horse lean on us on their yes. front legs. And the bit is the equivalent of a walker for a horse. And they can have no self-carriage that way. There's no, there, and, and the, I haven't heard that term in a long time. Yeah, yes. I ask that question a lot. It's like, do you? <laughs> yeah. So where's the self-carriage? Where's the self-carriage in if that? If it's that heavy, where's that self-carriage we all yeah. talk about? Yeah. Interesting. And that is because we get so mired down in the details of things like tracking up, we're not really assessing. We're not really even thinking of the question. My horse is tracking up, but the pole is dropped. I'm in a leverage bit. And even in a leverage bit, I need huge thigh blocks to be able to hold my horse up. You know, so I have a dressage saddle with massive thigh blocks and a deep seat because my horse pulls on me so much. Well, you just became a better walker a better support system, mm -hmm. right? And all of that, nobody in there, everybody's trying to find a quick solution to the problem without asking the question, where's the self-carriage? Yeah, and it, it yeah. goes back to the use of the spine with horses and people teaching somebody to coordinate their <laughs> head, neck, back, and pelvis so they don't have to brace Yes. with their arms and their legs and that's spinal integrity i mean that's life changing it changes the the length of your life yeah or your mobility right right no and even watching my dad who needed a walker for the first time after having heart surgery now working with his personal trainer his goal is shorter walks without the walker but since he's outside on uneven ground he'll take the walker but he goes now I just push it so oh, his has wheels huge. 
So mm -hmm. instead of the stable one without wheels, he has one with wheels and it's it's got a seat if he needs to sit down. It's got wow. wheels. Yeah, it's got a handbrake. It's like it's, you know, the deluxe walk. It's a much better design now than, than the, the old the walkers. old fashioned stuff. Yeah. Which were just sort of that aluminum frame that mm -hmm. has no wheels and it's super stable. <clears throat> this one is stable to lean on, but it has I think two wheels on it something like that. I, I have to look at it closer. But now what he does is he can push it because there's a way to push the walker with the wheels rather than leaning on it in order to move. Yeah. And I go, that's like a bit. If the bit is sort of the walker, you maybe the horse leans on it a little bit, but as they get their balance, they push the walker. They don't lean on the walker. Right. So if a horse is heavy on the bit, they're leaning or heavy on the reins, they're leaning on the walker. And when the horse is carrying themselves, they can be connected to it, right? But they're not leaning on it. And that's the difference between the contact and the aid. Yes. That, yeah. 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 And, and actually, I, and go we'll ahead. have to talk about that when we talk about rain contact. Um, the instinct of the human is always to pull, to shorten. Yeah. I was just going to yeah. say that I'm actually glad we did this podcast before the First. rain contact because, yeah. <laughs> because <laughs> like the whole tracking up thing, it was just fascinating to me that I go, judges are still using that in wow. their criteria, in their assessment of the rider, in their scoring. And, and when my client turned around and said, well, why? And isn't it possible that, like, why are you using that? Well, it shows engagement, but isn't it possible that it's the front hoof not leaving the ground? It's not actually the engagement of the hind hoof stepping forward. And it really gave the experienced judges a little bit of pause. That's good. I thought that was great because it's not in the judging criteria, but it's used all the time. Interesting. And in her group evaluations or where they all judged one rider and then compared their scoring sheets, um, she could defend her decision on different horses. Good. Yeah, because people said, well, why did you score that horse so low when we all scored it much higher on the free walk or the stretchy walk or something? And she said, because um, blah, blah, blah. And they go, but the horse was tracking up so well. And again, she goes, it, it, not an accurate criteria of engagement. Right. It's too simplistic. It's a lazy way to look for engagement. And that's important. Th um, and we do that. I think we, we are always looking at movement by looking at the legs. Yes. And not looking at what's going on with the back because the kinematics of the legs is just a reflection of what's going on on the back. Yes. And that's the same thing with people. So the way we use our head, neck, back, and pelvis dictates the use of the arms and the legs. Absolutely. Yeah. And so any horse on the forehand is going to be uneven. So if we think of every stride of every leg, the leg swings forward and hits the ground. Once it hits the ground all the way to peak vertical, the legs are doing the job of resisting, technically called braking, like brakes in our car. So it resisting falling forward, resisting internal body weight falling forward, resisting nose in the dirt kind of Irish, right? Resisting falling. Then the leg hits peak vertical, which theoretically should be actually vertical. Yeah, right. So that would be a good thing for people to look at. Is it vertical? In the transition between the tra breaking, yeah. right? So the transition between sort of the deceleration, or I like to call it the stabilizing phase of the stride. That's right. really what's happening. So the hoof lands, resists falling, right? Then 
transitions into propelling and pushing. So technically that's the braking phase, peak vertical is the transition phase, and then the pushing phase, and then it begins again. So it's just like us, if we're walking down a steep hill, right? We don't necessarily get more engagement or control by taking longer strides. Right. We might have to take short little strides to not fall forward while we go down the hill. And that's interesting because um, it can really be compared to the horse, the, the going down the hill. What we tend to do is lock and brace. But if you see a toddler go down a hill, what are they going to do? They're going to run. They're going to use that momentum and they're going to use all their joints very quickly, mm -hmm. which is biomechanically <clears throat> much, much better than us bracing Leaning and locking back. our joints. And, yes. Yeah. I work with people a lot, especially here in Virginia with stairs because there's oh, a yeah. whole, there's stairs a whole setup that we do mentally. It's our habit. It's our tape of how we go up and down stairs. No, and in Florida, we don't have stairs because this is where everybody comes to retire. <laughs> <laughs> They're done with stairs. They come to Florida from here. <laughs> yeah. That's funny. Yeah, no more stairs. No more, no more stairs. And, you know, that's, it brings, and I wonder what it brings up in the horses, probably personality issues of, you know, it brings up with the walker the idea, the fear of falling. Absolutely. Because the fear of falling. Yes. The central and it's, nervous system is not happy. Right. So as soon as, whether it's a hind hoof or a front hoof, as soon as it swings forward and hits the ground, that phase of the stride is where they either have control or they don't. Right. Right. So if they don't have control, that fear of falling is just as real for a horse with too much weight on the forehand as it is for a person on a walker. Right. Right. And then, and that's what happened when I took away the bit leverage or just my rein support for my extra dressage horse that was used to that. He just kept going faster and faster. And that's where I thought we were going to somersault because yeah, they want to use speed because they, they don't know what they don't know. About. And it literally felt like we were running down a hill. Yep. Like that's, and I thought, oh my God, th this is like, he's, some people, little kids can run down a hill, but they have a balance and other people run down a hill and it's out of control because they're exactly. looking for momentum to, to create stability. Right. There is a certain stabilizing force in momentum. Yes. Right. So the faster you go, sometimes the more stable you feel, even with bad mechanics. And that's what my horse was doing. If I keep going faster and faster and faster, maybe I won't fall. But that fear of falling, it, it even though he was going faster and faster, trying to find some stability, he was completely out of control. Yeah. Right. And, and not even in a scary way, like bolting, he wasn't bolting and it wasn't like a fear thing. He just literally didn't know how to control his own body weight once I took pressure off the bit. Wow. And I go, so I kind of threw him in the deep end. Like it would be like grabbing somebody's walker and saying, figure it out. Right. You know, it's a little scary. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. But like watching my dad gradually reduce his dependence on the walker and being able to get out of a chair without using his arms, that took training from his personal trainer. Right. And That's, some weightlifting yep. and some conscious control and some slowing things down and rethinking how he did everything. And I go, That's what I experienced training a horse is you got to kind of go back to strengthen the core of the body, the axial yes. skeletal muscles, right? When that's stronger, you're not as dependent on your arms to get out of a chair or you don't have right. to sit down to put your socks on or you don't have to, you know, and for the horse, it's the weaning them off the bit process, right? right. The only way you can wean them off the bit is to actually increase their own strength in their braking mechanism. So how they use the leg placement 
and the muscles of the back and hindquarter to control their own body weight and control their own motion. And I find nine times out of 10, they're nowhere near tracking up when they start that process. I go, it starts with baby steps, just it like it would steps. for us. It is that with people too. Yeah. And yeah. you've got, like you said, it's got, you have to bring the subconscious to the conscious. Look and that's at the, the habit. slow part. Yeah. Yes. Reintroduce different ways of use. Absolutely. And, you know, I was listening to one of my favorite podcasts and they're talking about um, martial arts and it's the same in martial arts. You don't train fast. You train with conscious control slowly, like even Tai Chi, that's really a training venue for, say, Kung Fu, right? right. So you don't train quickly. You train no. slowly. You learn the feeling of each muscle, each movement. You find the balance and the coordination slowly. Then when everything speeds up in an actual fight or spar or whatever you call it in martial arts it's like all of that is just there and available without thinking about it because you took right. the time to slowly condition the nervous system develop the strength and the coordination as a habit so then when it is fast it's still good coordination that's what gives yes. the martial artists their power right but if you try to train fast, it's just a hot mess. Yeah. Or and train um, in a in a time frame. You know what I mean? Like in 30 days. Yeah. You need to be a black belt in 30 days. We're going to be here. Yeah. We're yeah. going to be here. <laughs> so hurry up. Yeah. Hurry up. Hurry we're up. going to be here. And I go, bodies don't work that, that way. Work. Yeah. Bodies don't work that way. So any last thing you want to add to the tracking up? Because I can't believe... Like I've been so out of the competitive loop for so long that my client yeah, going too. in to learn how to be a judge, it was like, ooh, I get to peek over the fence and sort of see what's going on. <laughs> and I, I mean, I was thrilled <laughs> at the written judging criteria. I thought, wow, the written judging criteria. But is that really being... Is that really being used? I don't There's know. There's a big disconnect between the, the actual judging, scoring, and verbal communication of balance. There was just mm -hmm. this massive disconnect from my perspective between that and what was written. And I was like, oh, so everybody agrees on the theoretical ideal. We just don't know how to assess it. And part of there why you we, go. we don't know how to assess it is because we're looking at the legs. Or we're looking at the head and exactly, neck position. Exactly, and not the back. Yeah. Heights. And there are ways to assess balance, not looking at the legs, not looking at the neck position specifically. But I go, that's the piece that isn't really broadly understood, I would say. I would say that simplistic view yes. is still mostly the mainstream. Yep. Anything else you want to add? Yep. And it reminds me of power That's walking it. people. So I've I've been with you when we see one of those over ambitious power walkers pumping arms, taking long strides, going very fast. And what's your take? We can all see that in our minds. It's like, okay, I got the earbuds, it it, got the music we going. We have well, and we're so out of our bodies at that point. You know what I mean? We're we're considering it as a task instead of involving the the subconscious conscious self in the whole activity. We're just doing the activity to get it done, and not and with thinking power about. Walking, I think the whole thought is. Like I'm watching people excessively swing their arms and try to increase stride length. And I think they're thinking in terms of joint mobility, power, calorie burning, strength building, faster equals better. So I go, of course, it's still happening to horses because yeah. we do it to ourselves. But yeah, more I've is watched, better. I've watched you cringe because you your eye goes straight to the axial skeleton and the first thing you see is all the dysfunction around those 
dramatically moving limbs, right? Exactly. And that's what I see with dressage. I go these big swinging long strides. I call it the elephant walk in a horse. And that's what everybody <laughs> wants to see. And to me, it's like power walking. I go, the exaggeration of the limbs has nothing to do with balance. And sometimes exactly. pushing our horses to go faster and taking longer strides like a power walker actually destabilizes the axial skeleton, which it yeah, does in a human. Yeah, because they have to lock their back to do it. Mm -hmm. Just they have like to a... lock every th their back to, to get that kinematics of the legs. Yes. Yes. All right, we better wrap it up there. Thanks for going down the rabbit hole with tracking up for me. But I I just, <laughs> I love the opportunity to sort of share this story that it's not part of the written judging criteria, it's but it's just a habit of what judges look at. And really that's all it is. It's a because habit. As soon as my client questioned the judges, they had to rethink it and say, yeah, actually that's possible. And maybe I need to look at Good. that differently. Plant Which that I was, seed. I know, plant that seed. All right. Plant thanks. That seed. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. And we will see you next time. Please like, share, subscribe. If you've lasted this long, you probably already have. Um, <laughs> and comment. <laughs> Give us ideas. We love comments. Oh, yes. Oh, and actually, I am starting a new playlist on the YouTube channel based on a comment. Because when we talked about rotation, horses' spinal functions, the two functions of how rotation and lateral bending um, work together, I got a comment that that would be really helpful to see. And it is still on my plan. Oh. Um, but I started a new playlist on YouTube Good. called the Horse Geeks Classroom. And that's where I'm going to put some of the stuff we talk okay. about on the podcast I'm going to be populating that playlist with stuff um, that's more theoretical than sort of how to, because I have the horse okay. geeks hacks, which are just how to, but I wanted to do some stuff more theoretical on YouTube. So horse geeks classroom will be the playlist name. So thanks cool. everybody. If you lasted this long, you get that little bonus bit of information and <laughs> thanks for joining us. We'll see you uh, on the next episode. Bye. Bye, everybody.